أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة الصلاه حي على الفلاح الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأطهر المرسلين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب رب العالمين محمد صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهله الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وتركها على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the most merciful, all praise is due to Allah. We bear witness that no one is worthy of worship but Allah, and we bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is indeed his final messenger. The best of speech is the book of Allah, and the best of guidance is the guidance of Muhammad It was during time like this, in the same year where the Prophet, peace be upon him, lost two very close family members to him. This is happening in Mecca, in the midst of atrocities, in the midst of torture and persecution against him personally, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and against his companions. However, during that time, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had two people protecting him. One was giving him protection in the outside, and one was giving him protection inside. The one giving him protection outside was his uncle, Abu Talib. Not a believer, but he loved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He raised him, and he made sure, yes, the people were against him sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but nothing happens to the well-being of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was that protector. And all the elites of Mecca, they want to do something to him, peace be upon him, but they can't because they know that Abu Talib is there and Abu Talib is a very important figure, so he is providing this protection for him. And then he had his most beloved wife, Khadija, radiallahu anha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. She is the one that is comforting the Prophet, peace be upon him. Outside, he's being called a liar, a sorcerer, a madman, a magician. And he's being belied left and right. But when he comes to Khadija, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her, she would provide him with that comfort. And in the same year, Abu Talib dies, and also Khadija dies. Those of us who have lost a loved one, 
somebody that was very close to us. Maybe it was a very protective mother. Maybe it was a very caring father. Maybe it was a son or a daughter, an uncle, a grandparent, an aunt. Whatever the case is, a lot of people are able to relate to this. I loved my mother so much, but she's gone now. My father, I loved him so much, I look forward to him coming home. Because I knew that with my father around, things were good. Or my grandfather or grandmother, whatever the case is. So people who have had, who have had that kind of a loss can relate to this. And here is the Prophet, peace be upon him, two, the most two important people in his life in one year are gone. And once that happens, we become very vulnerable, easily exploited, especially the younger that you are. And that is why the Quran reminds us, the believers, take care of the orphan. Because at such a young age, they lose a parent or two who's there to take care of them. They can so easily be exploited and marginalized. So we are told, make sure that you take care of them. And here the Prophet, peace be upon him, loses both people and there is really no replacement to them. The same way that there is no replacement for a mother or for a father or for a child or for just a person, there is no replacement for them. And here is the Prophet ﷺ feeling all lonely, never going to despair, but just that idea of how, how sad it is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Saying, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if all of humanity decides to abandon you, then your Lord will not abandon you. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, is taken into this journey that is referred to as Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. It was during a time like this that the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the same night is taken from Mecca to Medina, the same night. This is 1400 years ago. A trip that generally speaking took about a month getting on your camel and sometimes walking all the way from Mecca all the way up to Jerusalem. The Prophet peace be upon him was taken on that journey in the same night. It referred to as an Isra journey at night. But then something even more beautiful takes place and that is the Prophet peace be upon him is ascended into heaven where he went beyond Beyond, no other being has been, including Jibreel alayhi salam. And there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a meeting takes place. But not really to go into the details of what happened there, but the lessons that, the lessons that we learn. See, in our um, daily lives, we will have, we're social beings. We will have people that we are close to. And some people that we are close to may either depart us because of death, because they travel, because they relocate, because they change or because we change. So they said that make sure that our utmost hope, our absolute hope is only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more hope we put on people, the more we are prone to being disappointed. The more hope you put in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the more comfortable we will be. So our hope is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So put your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not put your hope in people, you will be disappointed. The same way that if you consider Islam to be great because of the people that are around you, Wallahi, you will be disappointed. And I tell you, I will disappoint you. Other people will disappoint you. Because the goodness of anything is not to be measured by who is committed to it. But rather it should be able to stand on its own. And as such, we're not disappointed. Either when they leave because of death, because they depart, because they change, because they relocate. So that is lesson number one. The more hope we have on Allah, the less hope we have on people, the least likely that we will be disappointed. And then the other thing is, and this is, this is where it gets to be a bit sensitive, of how important Jerusalem is to the Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the very beginning, you know, we're doing our daily prayers. And initially the Prophet, peace be upon him, is commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where you need to be aiming is towards Jerusalem. That is the place 
one of the oldest cities in the world. And this history of the city is always religious. This is where Abraham and Lot migrated. David, Solomon, Jesus, this is where they were born. And Moses, Jacob and Isaac, this is where they are buried. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this is where they are taken. This is where he is taken on that night journey. So Jerusalem is very dear and near to the heart of a, of a believer. And sadly, what is happening to this holy city nowadays is anything but holy. There is nothing holy that is taking place in Jerusalem nowadays. I will come back to this topic. You know how subhanAllah in few days, people will be celebrating the 4th of July. The idea of independence, freedom, part of the British Empire. People felt that they were being taxed without representation, taxation without representation. Somehow all the goods are going to the king or the queen and nothing is really left here to the people. And people revolted against that. That this is not what we bargained for. This is not what we pay our taxes for. And they fought. And it was a beautiful fight. Because it was fight for freedom and for justice. And rightly so, that is commemorated every 4th of July where people are reminded of this precious gift of freedom. But see, brothers and sisters, many times we have this idea about freedom. Freedom is when I go to the market and I buy whatever I want. That does not make you free. That just makes you a consumer. And many times a foolish consumer as well. Said, you know what, it's so free. You go up there and there is just so much varieties of coffee and tea and toothpaste and detergents and soap. And you know, I go there and it's up to me to choose. It's my freedom. That is not what is meant by freedom. And what we have done is that we have confined freedom to just that little and we forgot our freedom and where it really needs to be practiced. Alhamdulillah, today I see a lot of young people and it's always beautiful to see young people in the masjid. Because that's really where we want our young people to be belonging, in a masjid. And as such a reminder of what freedom is all about. Freedom is truly practicing that given gift of freedom in choosing your values. See, values are things that we choose. And we make a big mistake when we let somebody else choose our values for us. So it's your freedom to choose what kind of values you want to live life by. So make sure that you choose the right values. And most important, make sure that it is you who is doing the choosing. We have the right to choose our values. That's a freedom. Practice it. We have the right to choose our friends. Who are the people that I hang around with? Part of self-respect. Young people, listen to this. Part of self-respect is that I choose who are going to be my companions. Who is the kind of company that I am going to keep around me. That is a freedom. But it's pointless if you don't choose it. And if you don't practice it. So that is another freedom. Make sure that you choose and make sure that you do a wise choice. We have the freedom to choose our actions. Make sure that you choose right actions. But then again, brothers and sisters, we cannot be celebrating our freedom where we are oppressing somebody else. We cannot truly be celebrating our freedom and, and feel secured in our freedom so long that we actively participate in the oppression of other people and suppressing their own given gift and right of freedom. That is the most pathetic way of trivializing and jeopardizing our own freedom. So as we want to protect our freedom, the best way to protect our freedom is to make sure that we protect the freedom of those who are around us. Let me give you an example. People know what's happening in Gaza. 1.5 million people a blockade is being happening against them. The saddest of all, the people who are imposing the blockade, they themselves have been the victims of similar blockades only 50 years back. The Holocaust is not ancient history. It's still today, we have got survivals of the Holocaust. And these people know what it meant and what it is like to go through a Holocaust what it feels like to live in a ghetto. Did you know that Jews in Europe 
were literally placed in a ghetto. The word ghetto is a word that was invented in Italy and in Europe, in England and Italy specifically, where Jews were placed in a ghetto because the Christians in that part did not want Jews to defile the city with their filth, or so we are told. So Jews were, fell, were forced into these ghettos and they were not allowed to come out of it. This was their prison, their confinement. Solely on the basis that they are Jewish people. They're kept in that place. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, gave them the freedom after being just selected, selected to be slaughtered on the, basis, on the basis that they are Jews. These people are now saved. The same way that they, they were saved by Moses alayhi salam. And you would think that of all people, these would be the last people to practice anything like that. Because they have been victimized by it. They would not want to be repeating history where now they are the perpetrators of that evil and of that wickedness. But subhanallah, this is precisely what we see nowadays. Those who were forced into the ghettos are now forcing Gazans into the ghettos. Those who were imprisoned are they themselves now who are imprisoning the people of Gaza. So here is what's happening. A group of people, people of conscience, they said, you know what, we don't approve of this. This is not right. What we're going to do is that we are going to defy this blockade that is taking place. We are going to break the siege against the people of Gaza. Everybody get on a boat. We are taking a lot of human aid and we're just going to Gaza. So they came up with the audacity of Hope Flotilla, a group of ships. Beautifully, the name, the audacity of Hope, that is actually the book, a bestseller, written by our president, Barack Obama, Audacity of Hope. So they said, that's such a beautiful title, we are going to adopt it, and we are going to make an audacity of hope by this trip that we are taking. What is beautiful about the people who are participating, this was an American group, these were not Muslims. Amongst the people who are on board of the ships are Holocaust survivors. One of them is an 82 year old Holocaust survivor. He said, I have been to the Holocaust. And what a shame it is that my people who have been the victims of the Holocaust are now the ones who are practicing this. I am going to make a statement there. Some of the people that are on the Holocaust today are some of the Israeli soldiers that were actually attacking previous flotillas before and now this soldier, I was listening to him yesterday on the radio saying that that was wrong and I'm here by inviting my fellow soldiers not to obey orders. So you see that these are the people who are getting engaged in this. But subhanallah, like what is happening in the Arab world, you know, people are just masses demonstrating against the dictatorship, wicked dictatorships. And that is why we commend the people of the commend the people of Tunisia and the people of Tunis. And inshallah, very soon we will be commending the people of Libya. And inshallah, very soon we will be commending the people of Yemen. And inshallah, we will be commending the people of Syria as well. Because people see this, say, wait a minute, enough is enough. This is pointless, this is senseless. You just cannot go oppressing people for so long and nobody says anything. But tactics have changed at this point. See, subhanallah, when you come to a tyrant with bullets and guns, usually the tyrant is better equipped. They have bigger guns and they have got more bullets than the masses. But at this time, the masses said, you know what? We're not firing bullets. We're just coming there to just peacefully demonstrate. And let's see you doing something about that. Subhanallah. See, the tyrant is weakest when you peacefully demonstrate against them. But the minute you fire a bullet against them, it gives them all the needed justification. They fired at us, and that is why we're firing back against them. Ehud Barak, he is now the defense minister of Israel. He said Palestinians are changing their ways. He said they're no longer becoming the suicide bombers, and they're no longer using terrorism. They are using peaceful means. And then he said, and that is going to be difficult for us. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Let me say that again. He said Palestinians are choosing and they're changing their tactics. They're no longer using bullets. They're no longer using suicide bombing. They're no longer using terrorism. 
they are using peaceful means and that is going to be difficult for us. What do you mean it's going to be difficult? What do you do to peaceful demonstrators? What do you do to people who are just coming saying, look man, let me just live. Let me just survive. Let me just be. The same way that the dictator in Egypt became very impotent. The dictator of Tunisia became impotent. When the masses came down and they said, enough is enough. And at this point, we are all saying no. What are you going to do to that? Some lunatics will do things such as the lunatic in Egypt or the lunatic in Libya. And also what we see are the torture and the atrocities that are taking place in Syria. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with the people of Syria, Ya Rabbil Alameen. You just see some of the most wicked, vicious atrocities. You know, I'm not sure if this has been mentioned to you or not from before. Hamza al-Khatib, just 13 year old kid, goes to the with his dad. And these are peaceful demonstration. They're just going down on the street saying, you know what, from now on, we're just sick and tired of this. No more. Father misses his son. Son is nowhere to be found. A week goes by. Hamza, alhamdulillah, is back. But he's back dead. Not only is he dead, he comes back broken bones, broken neck, markers of torture all over him. And sadly of all, his private part was also cut. Say, what kind of a human being carried something like this out. You have to be a beast to do something like that. But again, subhanAllah, please remember this brothers and sisters. See, these dictators, wallahi, they will die. And inshallah that we pray that they die in our lifetime, Ya Rabbil Alameen. They will die. But as soon as they die, their methods, they come to an end with them. But as soon as the martyrs die, it is the rule or of the martyr that starts living at that, at that point. So we see the flotilla. People are bored on the flotilla and they're saying, look, we cannot be part of this. Our tax dollars, these are my tax dollars and your tax dollars, they are supporting the blockade that is taking place. It is weapons that are made in this country that are destroying the buildings in Gaza. And some people said, this cannot be it. Congress people have said that. Dennis Kucinich has said that. So these people demonstrated and they said no. Well, here is the sad part. These are American citizens. And you know, America takes care of its people. If you are a US citizen, you hold that passport, America will be there for you. So these people, gentlemen and women, they make the decision that we are going to be boarding the flotilla. And Israel responds back. We will do our best not to harm you, but if we need to, we will do it. State Department comes out, and you would expect to say, look, do not, jeopardize you of, do not jeopardize the safety of American citizens. They come out and they say, whoever is going on the flotilla, they are irresponsible. You've got to be kidding me. I am going there, and I am saying, look, I'm just going to help out the people. Hand out humanitarian aid, medicine, food. And you're calling me irresponsible? What, is, what in the world is going on? But see, that's what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. That towards the end of time, there is a shift in what is moral and what is immoral. He said that a time is going to come when honest people are going to be called liars, and liars are going to be called honest. And you do not see this beautifully manifested as much as you see it in this, in this arena, in this area right here. So these people go there and they say, look, man, we're just helping people. They say, no, 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 you're wrong. SubhanAllah, the same thing that happened last year. They were so careful that they did not, they took plastic knives and forks with them so that nobody can accuse them of having any weapons on board with them. Despite that, nine people were killed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them as martyrs, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So here we have, and the last update I read before I came here, that should keep you updated because that is so beautiful. That people are going there risking their lives knowing that nine people were killed last year. They're still doing it. That is very admirable. That is a lot of courage that is out there. 
So these people go out there and they say, we're going. And again, you know, Greece and what is happening with their troubles, they said that the ship cannot really take over. Oh, it's not seaworthy. It is not very safe. Some people have been talking about people coming in and intentionally, intentionally ruining the ship. It took off and now it's being brought back by, you know, coast guards from the Greece government. And talk is that they have been pressured not to allow the ship to go there because it will be very embarrassing if anything happens to the people. And see, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, change is inevitable. Change is coming. Like that story of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, the people that you think that you lose hope, but then subhanAllah, something just inspiring comes. In the case of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala saying that, don't worry, if all of humanity is going to abandon you, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is not going to abandon you. And here in the case of the people of Gaza, yes, you know, all the Arab around them, uh, you know, the protocols and the bureaucracy and them being just busy keeping their seats at this point, lose hope in the Arab leaders, but do not worry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate by people of conscience. And the people of conscience today, the people who are truly heroes, are the people of the audacity of hope, the flotilla. So now we are reminded of hope, brothers and sisters. A Muslim never loses hope. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us al-fa'lu husnul khuluq. To be an optimist is the best of character. And to be a pessimist, that is the worst of character. So we remember Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. We do not forget about Jerusalem, but when we do so, we do so and we are all hopeful. Please inshaAllah move forward to make room for those who are coming in late. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسوله المصطفى وعلى من بآثاره اقتفى So we keep talking about hope and how important it is to have hope that is part of what we call, we call put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This concept of tawakkul. You know, putting your trust in Allah, putting your trust in people. Unfortunately, history tells us that we disappoint one another. So if you don't want to be disappointed, put your trust in your creator, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. I put my trust, all of it, into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We become hopeful. We pray for hope, but see again brothers and sisters, hope is not about just a great feeling. That is not hope, that's a delusion. That's not what we're talking about. Hope means that what I do may seem to be very little, but I am going to do it. So hope is about taking action. It's not about inaction and waiting. It is rather about doing and hoping inshallah, the little that we do is going to flourish that one day it will count. We may not reap the results of it, but we know that one day, inshallah, it will turn out to be something that is good. The fact that we see young people here today, we are hopeful that this is but little step that one day, inshallah, we will see them to be great leaders, good citizens in this beautiful, in this beautiful country. Like I like to remind my elders here, this is summertime. Please, please, brothers and sisters, this is the time to take care of our children. I've reminded you this before and I'm sorry if I'm sounding redundant. The months of June and July are the most dangerous times for teenagers in this country. That is when most of them get into car accidents. That is when most of them pick on bad habits because we have got the recipe for disaster. Three things make the months of June, July and August a recipe for disaster. A lot of free time for these kids. There is no school. A lot of free time, freedom, boredom, and lack of supervision. Parents are working. You know, it used to be from 8 to 3, and then they're unsupervised for about 2 hours. But now, it's all day long. What are these kids doing? Watching TV, getting bored, and they're free, and they're not supervised. Teenagers, they say that during this time, they seek to be thrilled. They want to be adventurous. Even if it means that they do things that are illegal or 
immoral. That is when most teenagers pick up on smoking marijuana, it is during this time. So please value the fact that this is going to be an awesome challenge for you if we have children and make sure that please, please that we provide, you know, some anti-recipe anti disaster for the freedom and the boredom and the lack of supervision. Now the masjid is inviting to please take part in the activities at the masjid. There is no place that will protect our children like this religious identity. And that has only be nourished in a masjid. Please make sure that you participate. They've got an intensive um, program, summer program that is coming up. It's on Wednesdays and it is on tafsir. Beginning this Wednesday and going on for, for a while. So please make sure that you come yourself and make it a family, a family event. We're going to the masjid to attend a class. They have summer camps for kids. Make sure that you put your kids in these summer, in these summer camps. And yes, sometimes they may be costly. But that is the price that we have to pay if we want to make sure that our children, good values are instilled in them, there is a price to be paid, brothers and sisters. Nothing here takes place for free. You've got facilities to take care of and what have you, so please make sure that you participate in this. And also look into the different agencies in the area, you know, where they deliver different services, be it different masajid or our own agency at Access California, and I think I've told you this before, a class that is delivered every Wednesday on sex education for teenagers, people from 13 to 18. That is, the reality is, this is a very sexualized society, culture that we're living in. These kids are bombarded with sexual images from such an early age. How do you contend with that? They've been told about sex left and right. The media tells it, the music tells it, friends tell it. Everything around them is sexualized. How do they contend with it? So what we have is a sex education class held on Wednesdays for these teenagers. So please make sure that you participate in this. And most of all, finally, please appreciate the people on the flotilla. Please appreciate them. These are people who paid their own money. These are people who are risking their own lives. These are the people who are taking the risk of going to a place where people will not think twice of killing you. So for these people, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them success in this mission of theirs, Ya Rabbul Alameen. These are beautiful group of people and wallahi, wallahi, we pray for them. Be they Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, we pray for them and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them, guides them and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them success, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Allahumma ya Rabbi rmi al-zalimeen abil zalimeen. Ya Rabbi rmi al-zalimeen abil zalimeen. Allahumma ya Rabbi rmi al-zalimeen abil zalimeen. Wa akhrijna min bayni aydihim salimeen. Birahmatika ya arham al-rahimeen. Allahumma ya Rabbi farraj hamma al-mahmoomeen. ونفس كرب المكروبين وقض الدين عن المدينين اللهم ارحم موتانا واشف مرضانا وفك أسرانا وعاف مبتلانا واختم بالصالحات الباقيات آجالنا اللهم يا رب بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان وارزقنا فيه صالح الأعمال والأقوال برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزيدكم ولذكر الله أكبر الله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة